Welcome to the eighth meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. Uh, I've received apologies today from Mary Gujan, MSP, and Jackson Carlo, MSP. Our first item of business today is the third evidence session in our inquiry into Scotland's screen sector, uh, in which we will focus today on commissioning. I'd like to welcome the witnesses, David Smith, David Smith, uh, the National Representative for S uh, Scotland in PACT, uh, Donald Campbell, Chief Executive of MG Alba, and David Strachan, Managing Director of Tern TV. Um, I'd like to invite David Smith to make an opening statement. I'd just like to thank the committee again for paying attention to this subject uh, and looking into it in such detail and inviting us all here today. Um, as I understand it, we're here to talk uh, really about the impact of quotas and commissioning across the UK, locally and at network level. And I think there, there are points that we've raised in these meetings beforehand, uh, and it's worth going back over some of them uh, and talking about the, the nature of commissioning. There's been, there have been great improvements in the last few years, um, you know, led in part by the, this, the, committee, the committee's work, but also the Scottish Government at a national level. Um, we, MG Alpa, BBC Alpa's emergence was the first step in making our domestic market stronger. Uh, the new BBC Scotland channel is another step in that direction. Moves are, that Ofcom are about to undertake to review representation within British television and then out of London and the rules that apply to out of London, I think are, uh, you can't over uh, overstress how essential that's going to be in setting the weather for the next few years. Um, when the rules first came into play in about 2009, uh, the BBC undertook uh, network supply review, which meant that a lot of the opportunity that was apparently present through the quota was met through the lift and shift process and moving large projects that consumed multiple hours and, and high value in some cases to Scotland and the, the other nations and regions to absorb con a quota. Uh, that was meant to be a short-term tactic that built uh, jobs at a certain level in production, but it became over-relied upon. And I think there's a, a acceptance now across the board from the broadcasters and the authorities that there we need to kind of move on from that and we ha we are moving on from it but uh, the rules that ofcom put in place in the next 10 years for the next 10 years uh, will help determine the kind of outcomes that we seek and i think that's the point that we need to kind of focus upon we know what the outcomes were last time we need to think about what the outcomes we seek this time are and work from that to develop a process that delivers those outcomes and for me it it's about if you want to commission, uh, if you want to set something against a Scottish quota, look to Scotland for it. If you want to commission from a Welsh quota, look to Wales for it. Don't commission London to London and displace elements of a production to the nations and regions. Um, and that's, that's important for various reasons, one of which, that again can't be overstressed, is intellectual property and the value of intellectual property. If we own the IP, then we are in the driving seat. You know, it's the idea the commissioner wants, it's the idea the broadcaster seeks. That's always gonna be the fundamental kind of first step if your ideas aren't up to scratch, the quota doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, that's why projects get lifted and shifted around the UK. So as a nation, I think we have to improve our IP development. We have to improve our ideas in television. And uh, having a stronger domestic market encourages that, makes it more likely and more possible. Um, but we have to work to a system that delivers London, uh, nations and regions quotas from the nations and regions on the basis of the strength of our ideas and our companies. Thank you very much. Uh, and as you, as you just said, um, there was a lot of criticism of the the, the current and previous system. Uh, the Screen Sector uh, Leadership Group, which is what our inquiry is uh, based upon, uh, said that 10% of a production budget can be spent in Scotland with 100% uh, being set against uh, the quota. Uh, you said that things are improving and you're, you're hopeful that the Ofcom review will make a big difference. What does Ofcom have to do? What would you like to see Ofcom putting in place as a result of its review that changes the system? It is, it, I should say it is improving, but it, is, it remains very mixed. Um, I was doing a review of the Out of London Register that Ofcom published for 2016. Their new register for 2017 isn't out yet. Um, and I was looking at the main projects that Channel 4 commissioned from Scotland. And it's, you know, there, as we've discussed in this meeting before, there, there's a spectrum of behaviour. There are things that are clearly authentically wholly owned and operated with, from within Scotland. There are things that have a, a minimal footprint within Scotland. Um, 
And there are things that sit in the middle. And 15 to 1, for example, is a project that sits in the middle of that spectrum. It, it has delivered good, high-value jobs to Scotland. It's helped build upon our expertise in quiz. It's occupied studios. It has started careers uh, on, that, on that quiz, a game show kind of ladder. But it accounts for, by my estimates, about 20% of Channel 4 spend in Scotland. And it's made by Remedy, who are not owned and operated in Scotland. The profits, the development, all, all re return back to London. Um, so that's in the middle of the spectrum. If you look at the rest of Channel 4 spend, there are two other projects I'd, I'd draw your eye to. One is Eden, uh, which was made by Keo North, who closed their Glasgow office midway through the production. Um, it wasn't a happy production. It didn't necessarily go very well. I think it was originally commissioned as a 12-part series, and I could be wrong, but I think four were transmitted in the end. That was, uh, by most kind of estimates, uh, around £10 million worth of Channel 4 spend in Scotland over the last two years, uh, 2016 and 2017. Um, and then you have something called a, a comedy programme called Man Down, uh, made by uh, Avalon with Greg Davies. Um, again, a minimal footprint within Scotland. There seems to be a, an office in Glasgow that houses a development exec who isn't actually credited in the series. We don't know the figures for what was spent on each of those projects, but we can, we can estimate based on what we know things cost and what the channels are, are likely to spend. And I suspect that between 15 to 1 Eden and Man Down, you're looking at close to 50% of Channel 4's claimed spend within Scotland. Now, I'm not sure that's the outcome we seek. So we have to ask Ofcom to look again at the, at the rules. Um, as you know, at the moment, it's a three-part test. You have to meet a substantive base and or 70% of your production spend with various exclusions against that and or 50% of your talent spend, excluding on-screen on talent. Um, I think the substantive base needs to be looked at very carefully. What is and is not a substantive base? Um, at the moment, it seems to be taken to mean anywhere from where a production executive or a production manager sits to a development executive. I would think that it needs to look. At, you need to look at chief executive officer and chief operating officers within companies and where they're where they are based, um, and where do they pay tax? That's the determining factor. Where do those high value key key roles pay tax? If they're based within Scotland, that's a clear indication that they are. Uh, they are a Scottish company. You then need to look at the, the levels of spend. And I think if you look at the uh, projects like Eden uh, or Mandyne, Mandyne doesn't claim to have spent 70% of its budget within Scotland or outside of London. As you said, you can spend as little as 10% within Scotland, provided you have an out of London footprint that, is, that meets the full, the full figure. Um, if you look, look at a project like that, there, it, it doesn't seem to serve any great purpose. It's not an outcome that we would seek on any level. Um, so if, at the same point, there is a, an element of flexibility required within the system because as Scottish producers, we want to be able to make programmes across the UK and internationally. So you have to have a bit of give and take within it. And it may be that there's an, a question of pro rata attribution of spend. So if a project like Man Down wishes to be set, uh, or the channel wishes to set that project against the Scottish quota, how much actually impacted upon the Scottish economy? set that amount against the Scottish quota, not the full value of the project. Right. Um, I wonder if other panel members would like to come in on that, and specifically how, what would their suggestions be in terms of what Ofcom is doing, what outcome would they like to see of the review? It's a difficult one because <clears throat> uh, you're, we all know what the end result is that we want to achieve, um, but defining where that that end result, uh, you know, where, where you draw the lines between them. <clears throat> uh, we've talked about snooker ad nauseam, um, and we don't want to go back into that again. But y you know, that, the, the argument over that fell over what constitutes um, um, managed and um, creating new opportunities for new production. Who was doing that? Um, I think, as an illustration, uh, what one might say is that if you if you lift and shift a game show up to Scotland. It may run for a number of years, and as David says, it may create some jobs in that genre. Um, most of the work will go to paying for the plant, for, for the studios that the game show is recorded in, which is of great benefit to BBC's PQ. Um, but you, you, you will create within the production company there a handful of jobs. Um, if you spend a similar amount of money on factual programmes, and we can see this because we're a, as a company, we're a parallel. Um, we have 50 jobs in the office at the moment, and six of those are about generating new and fresh ideas which represent the culture and people of Scotland. 
Mr. Cam thank you. Mr. Campbell? Um, I'm not sure I have uh, too much to, to offer the, right. the, the committee on this. Uh, I would say that um, Ofcom's role in this is, is, very, is very important. I say equally important is that the sector and that the broadcasters have a strategy for growing the indigenous sector and that it's clear how that strategy is going to, going to be prosecuted. Um, so you need both of those things uh, to work in tandem and there's a lot of work to do there. I mean, do you, do you think that Ofcom should make agreements with the with the television companies in terms of minimum production spend? Oh. It's, that's potentially possible, but I, th I think it's it's better to work on the volume and value quotas uh, and see how they are addressed and delivered. Um, I should 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 have said at the start, uh, Pact Council haven't come to a firm view on this. The Out of London Review hasn't been. Uh, put out into the public domain but yet by Ofcom. We expected it to be around about this point, but we haven't seen it yet. So my opinions that I'm uh, putting forward today are, are essentially my opinions on what I'll be putting forward within PAC Council. PAC may come to different conclusions as we go forward. Um, what I think would be useful as well for Ofcom to, to think about is the process for auditing and reviewing projects. At the moment, there doesn't seem to be a, a, a process for, for raising points about projects set against the Out of London quota how they are then dealt with and what the outcomes of that process is. Um, we raised, um, we've raised two points over the last uh, few years, one about snooker, one about man down. I'm not sure we've had an answer really about man down yet, and that's probably a year after we first raised it. Um, so a, a, a timely process for the addressing of complaints, a little bit of proactive auditing by Ofcom wouldn't go amiss, and then a question about what the consequences are. And we're keen to ensure that money does not leave the system. So if our broadcaster was fined for misapplication uh, of a project against the quota, that would diminish our ability to make programmes in the following year because they'd left money to spend. So instead, they should, I would argue, be required to add back in the spend that was misapplied so that the following year rises rather than falls. Um, that would seem to be a, a kind of equitable solution to all. I should say that members have been provided with a copy of Ofcom's independent and regional production compliance form. Uh, and the form doesn't appear to ask for detailed information or evidence uh, regarding the production team's usual place of residence or work. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about in terms of the difficulty in ensuring that uh, filmmakers are complying with the regulations that we have at the moment? An element of spot checking, you know, a bit more detail required on that, that form, uh, an undertaking by the production company and the broadcaster that it, it is legal, decent, honest and true, that this is, you know, exactly, it, it's authentic, that we, they have met the, the spirit as well as the letter of, of the rules. And then Ofcom's ability to check on that. Now, Ofcom's not a proactive system. It's a reactive system. If you, if you raise a complaint, Ofcom investigates. Um, maybe that has to change. Thanks. I'll move on to Claire Baker. Oh, um, thank you, convener. Um, I did want to ask, sorry, I expected it, I think it was Rachel that was going to come in next, but... Um, I think actually Veen has asked um, the question that I was going to ask, which was about minimum production spend, but I can um, develop um, the question if you like. Um, what I wanted to know is um, about the impact the current spending on production um, by public service broadcasters having on independent producers in Scotland, because um, the Association of Film and Television Practitioners in Scotland said that factual television seems to be relatively healthy, um, but there's... And there's and there's been successes in children's drama, um, but you'd be hard f uh, pushed to find a recent television drama made by an independent Scottish production company commissioned by the BBC or Channel 4. So I just wondered, um, you know, what, what impact is this having on independent producers and how can, um, I mean, how, how can we encourage more independent producers to, to get involved? Um, we are, David and I are both factual producers. <clears throat> so... Um, we don't have expertise in drama, but um, what we do know is that drama is a very hard one to win um, because there are relatively few dramas, relatively high spend. So the perennial problem of trust between the producer and the uh, commissioning editor um, is, is magnified in drama. Um, it's hard enough for us in factual to persuade them that we're not going to go and um, drink their money or, um, you know, 
make a mess of the programme, but m much harder in drama. So <clears throat> it's about building relationships and what are the steps that could be taken. I can give you an illustration of steps that have been taken in factual to, to bridge those relationships. In, uh, in the Ofcom Advisory Committee's submission to you, they have talked about uh, Firecrest's um, initial small grant from Channel 4 um, leading to an investment from Channel 4 leading to, I think, they've, is it 30 or 40 jobs that they've now got and, and some well-established brands like Super Shoppers. It's that sort of progression. We had a similar one <clears throat> with Channel 4 where they invested in development in order that we could increase our development team, increase the volume of offers that we made to them, increase the dialogue that there was between us and the commissioners, and that resulted two years down the line in a substantial amount of commissioning. So it's, it's, it's those baby steps in between somehow that, that need to be imagined in order to make this happen. It won't just happen like that. And I would add to that that um, one, one of the difficulties that commissioners face is the making short-term decisions against more longer-term decisions with, with sectoral impact and sectoral benefit. So one of the things that we uh, at BBC Alp have done is we have a a uh, long-term agreement with Young Films and Sky to produce drama. It's a four-year agreement. So that kind of agreement uh, gives a measure of uh, certainty to the company, allows the company to plan, it allows the company to build up uh, its talent base, allows the company to work with agencies to develop training programmes and talent development programmes in line with the production. Uh, the, the amount of money we can put at the disposal of the company isn't as big as we would like, obviously given you know the bu budgetary constraints. But I think being able to make that longer term commitment um, to, to particular projects is essential. And it's not really a, a factor or a, a, an aspect which is commonly seen in our sector where, you know, audience trends um, are so variable. You know, pe people are worried that audiences will can, can leave you very, very quickly and go somewhere else. So that measure of trust between uh, broadcaster, commissioner and producer is is essential so that you know that uh, whatever happens to the audience, you, you might be able to flex direction or flex the storyline or flex even the brand uh, as as required. So there's a balancing act to be achieved there. I think that our sector hasn't yet probably achieved. There's also the, the broadcasters simply haven't looked to Scotland to produce drama of of, of network standard fairly often over the last kind of 10 to 12 years, that's started to change. So the BBC's commissioned two projects from Scotland, one from a non-qualifying indie STV Productions, which I'm sure Bobby can mention when he's in the second panel. Another one, Claire Mundell, who's a, a member of PACT. Uh, she's currently filming in Australia, but it's a, it's a Scottish uh, project. Um, so there is a change in that, that area. As David said, there are fewer dramas commissioned each year. Uh, the slot, the real estate, as we would describe it within the schedule, is limited. And there, it tends to be dominated by half a dozen London-based companies who have very good, strong reputations in delivery. So they're trusted by the broadcasters. And what we need to see happen over the next five to ten years is that trust established with Scottish-based drama producers and developers. Because if you look at, I mentioned three Channel 4 projects in my first answer. I could equally have picked out Jonathan Creek as a famously Scottish BBC production. Now, Jonathan Creek doesn't appear to me to have any more connection to Scotland than uh, Man Down, and yet it is set against the Scottish quota. At some point, somebody will have said, let's recommission Jonathan Creek, but can you make it in Scotland? Uh, and that, that question is, is really at the nub of this. We want to have the commissioner conversations with people who are developing content in Scotland to be set against that quota. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart McMillan. Um, thank you, Camilla. Good morning, panel. Uh, just it's a couple of questions just regarding uh, uh, the public and the industry uh, confidence uh, in the, the self-regulation area. And certainly, uh, do you consider that the, that the broadcasters have got a, a robust procedure uh, for actually handling uh, complaints about the suspected mislabeling of productions? Um. I think that it's fair to say there are questions, whether they, they fall on the broadcaster or fall on Ofcom. I would imagine that the broadcasters do exactly what's asked of them by Ofcom at the moment. It's a, a, a difficult one for them because um, they uh, have in the past, I think, relied upon the evidence that um, producers have given them. Um, and of course, there's, there's in-house stuff within the BBC as well. Um, I suspect that they're becoming more robust. I suspect they will have to become more robust because, as we see from 
next month onward, the advent of the screen unit within Creative Scotland with a substantial budget given by Scottish Government. Um, Scottish Government doesn't hand out money like sweeties. It is looking to that to be an investment. And because of the separate tax system now, if that money all drifts to places where tax is not being paid in Scotland, then the return on that investment will not be seen. So I think there's going to have to be a greater robustness. And I would say from a, a BBC Alipa perspective that um, this kind of mislabeling probably isn't, isn't an issue for us because our sector is completely indigenous. But what is important for us is um, transparency in, in decision making. And we, we try to be you know, very transparent about the process and about you know successes and failures in, in the in the tendering process as well, so that so that the sector generally understands why things haven't been successful or why it's not been recommissioned or whatever. I think the answers have been really interesting, but um, and it's kind of leads on to this next question. That's do you think that the that the data that's actually been collected uh, by the broadcasters is actually adequate, uh, particularly for projects uh, and project teams that are. Uh, that are outside of London. There's a weakness in the system in, in that you uh, you need to, if, if you are a London-based company and you do 70% spend and 50% talent and it's all over the UK, then you're counted as out of London, non-specific. If you have a permanent base, and you know that's the crucial thing is what's the definition of a permanent base, in, say, Scotland, and you do 70 and 50 outside, that counts as being Scottish. A very small proportion of that 70 may be in Scotland, but if it's out of London, then the home base trumps everything else, and that's where it's counted as. That's a weakness in the definition. That presumes, on the production spend criteria, that presumes that you know, around 30% of the production will be spent in London anyway, even if it is a nations and regions production, but the 70% also excludes huge lines of budget within each project. So the amount actually impacted on a nations and regions economy, you know, is, is it falls. And I, I, as a producer, when we deliver the information, there's no granularity in it. Um, you know, there's very little detail as to, you know, who fulfilled what role and, you know, where they're based. Asking producers to deliver that level of information is quite onerous. Uh, but I have to say that programme has completed forms, which is what we deliver when we deliver a programme, that's the, the background information, is already quite onerous. So I'm not sure how, if that's a, you, you'd be asking quite a lot of producers, but the benefit, I suspect, might outweigh the, the cost of that. I think it then kind of goes back to a point that was raised a few moments ago uh, regarding Ofcom with them being uh, more of a, a reactive operation as compared, compared to being proactive. Now, with, with what you just said there a few moments ago, uh, your response there, Mr Smith, now, if Ofcom actually had a, a different uh, way of working, uh, do you think that would actually help in this particular regard? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the, the broadcasters have to react to Ofcom systems. Um, so absolutely, that would make a huge difference. And that should be part of the Out of London review when it comes around. It will certainly be part of what, what I will be putting forward with the PAC Council, and I hope will form part, part of PAC's view in their response. We think they are becoming so. Um, they have uh, increased responsibilities since the Charter Review kicked in um, in the spring of last year. Um, and the number of staff they've got in their Edinburgh office has increased. Um, and the dialogue that we're having with them, I think, helps them to understand what the issues are um, and to identify weaknesses in their own systems in order to deal with them. In addition to that particular aspect, uh, what else do you think that, uh, the broadcasters could actually do to increase both the public and the uh, industry confidence uh, in their internal processes uh, for actually checking the compliance with Ofcom's uh, made out of London criteria? I mean, the, the first one is to end that conversation. I like it, but can you make it in Cardiff? Can you make it in Glasgow? You know, the, the commissioning decisions, London to London commissioning that displaces uh, elements of production is really the kind of flaw in the network supplier view that underpins most of the commission that's taken place over the last 10 years. That's, I should add, there's a lot of very good authentic commissioning. Uh, David mentioned Firecrest, Raise the Roof, Turns, Own Output with Channel 4. Channel 4's done a lot of really good, proactive building of infrastructure, building of companies within Scotland. And it's those outliers that kind of undermine all of that good work. And that, my question is really, why, would they, why do they think that's necessary? You know, why focus on something that is questionable? And I, I suspect that the new regime within Channel 4 will not rely on that to the same extent. 
Um, similarly with the BBC, there have been big changes in how the BBC structured over the last few years. The new charter is has a clear requirement that the BBC invests in the nations and regions' creative economies, uh, and that is starting to bear fruit. Um, but I think Ofcom, Ofcom's role in this, and Ofcom have moved substantial numbers of staff to Edinburgh, and they do seem to understand the devolved nature of, of our, our system now. Um, they very much get the point that out-of-London out of rules currently aren't working, so they are looking at all of this. It's just a question of how, how far will they go. And I think it's also important that whatever system they, they come up with applies to all broadcasters all public service broadcasters at network level. Uh, I had an example within the last couple of months of uh, a producer in London approaching us and saying, <clears throat> I have this commission. Um, I am told it has to be made out of Scotland. I have no connections with Scotland. Is there any way that you could, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And then after we'd done quite a lot of work on that, they came back and said, they found something else to shove up to Scotland now. We're just going to do our one in London. That sort of conversation should not be happening in this day and age. Uh, I'm a bit kind of flummoxed by that particular example because um, when you consider, um, I mean, this Parliament's been here for nearly 20 years now. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of devolution, you'd imagine that that, that people would probably uh, fully or, or understand a lot more uh, how important. Uh, that type of discussion actually, uh, how negative that type of discussion actually is, as compared to actually being, uh, being a positive. It's a slow process, but the fact that there is a forum such as this um, where these things can be discussed and democracy is functioning much better in Scotland than it used to means that you don't get these things swept under the carpet. But that then leads on to the, this uh, other question. Now, in terms of the screen unit, and both, uh, I think both Mr Smith and Mr Shackner have touched upon this, uh, how, how do you think the, what kind of impact do you think the screen unit is that going to have on the industry and, uh, and how it's going to be measured? Instead, I think the fact that they'll be putting money into productions gives them an audit power, which uh, Northern Ireland Screen, for example, currently enjoy. Um, and our discussions with them have, have been quite clear that they, they derive great benefit in terms of data. You know, it's very hard to hide things when you've got a, a right of audit over a project. At the same point, they've also been quite clear that even when something very clearly lands within the current ambit, you know, large chunks of spend will still not fall within the province. You know, will not fall within... Northern Ireland. Uh, and I suspect, suspect that's part of the necessary flexibility of it all. But the screen unit having a right of audit and hopefully having a, a team that is familiar with how television works, uh, because up till now they've been very much a film focused team. Uh, they have elements of drama expertise within television, but they're really being focused on film because that's where their, their money's been targeted. National lottery funding is only applicable to, to film. Uh, television is quite a different industry. It's funded in a different way, operates in a different way. I've been working in it since 2003 and I barely understand it. Um, you know, it takes time. Uh, the, it, it's a very nuanced uh, process. There is no such thing as the BBC. There are lots of different BBCs, which is why you end up with um, different levels of behaviour. So a commissioner has landed with the obligation to, to win ratings, but he's also landed with, or she's also landed with the obligation to spend money in Scotland. You know, they make quite human decisions, uh, which may not be entirely within the spirit of some of the, the rules. Uh, and it's about delivering that level of understanding throughout the organisation. Well, auditing is... Actually, Mr McMillan okay. or um, uh, okay. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Just to um, stay on the issue of the screen unit, I just wondered if you've had any discussions. Uh, you mentioned perhaps that the screen unit isn't as focused on television as it could be, or there's maybe not evidence to suggest that that will be a focus going forward. So I wonder if you've had any discussions or been involved in how the screen unit is going to be formed. We did take evidence last week from um, the uh, the stakeholders within, within, I don't know if you were able to see that last week, the evidence we took, whether you have any views on the on the skin unit going forward. Um, it, it's early days. Um, they have uh, appointed two um, people with an understanding of television to their kind of sub board, which is going to run them. I'm one of them. Um, one of the things that in the screen leadership group that we said would be a useful thing for it to do as far as television is concerned, um, because there was some concern about, um, you know, putting money into cookery shows and stuff like that. We don't want them to put money in, into that sort of production. You know, it's, it's relevant to invest in production when it's something like film or drama, but not in, in basic factual programmes. What we want them to do is to enhance our development potential, because the opportunity that Channel 4 particularly 
uh, will give, and we hope that when the rules are tightened up a bit, that there may be more opportunity within the BBC, is very significant. There's a huge potential growth, especially if we can persuade Ofcom to persuade Channel 4 not just to have increased out-of-London targets, but increased Scottish targets or increased nations targets, and don't, don't let it all go to Manchester, thank you. Um, the, 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 the stepping up that we will have to do to meet those opportunities is probably beyond our resources, even the more substantial companies, um, to grow organically. And if this green unit can be a catalyst to rapidly enhance the development that we can do to seize the moment now, that will be a great contribution. My, my point wasn't a direct criticism of Creative Scotland up to this point, because th they haven't had the money for television, so not having an expertise particularly in that area. They do have people who have knowledge of television, but a specific expertise is something they have to develop going forward, and it would be a criticism if in a year's time they haven't. Uh, but at present, it's understandable that, that most of their knowledge is in the film area. Um, I I'm, I'm, do have concerns um, that they consult with industry. You know, when they're talking about their funding models and how those will be applied to television, uh, I, I hope they will consult with PACT. I hope they will consult with industry quite widely. I have concerns that um, television is a, a moving feast at the moment. So we, at the moment, we have a big Netflix production underway within Scotland. Is that television? Is that film? You know, we need to have quite clear guidelines on that because clearly if it's for Netflix, it's a television platform, but it's, it is a film on a television platform. And how, how that would then... Uh, be a, would that be able to apply to the television pot of money rather than the film pot of money? And would that, what impact would that have? These are questions we, we kind of need to ask. That, that's quite helpful. I was going to ask about the new platforms such as Netflix and Amazon and the production within there and how Scotland can take um, advantage of that. Do you think there's more that could be done in Scotland to support companies taking advantage of those new opportunities? And would that be a role for the screen unit? Or it's, it's a good point you make around where the funding would lie between film and television. That, that's of interest. There's always opportunity cost. Um, we, uh, as a company, focused on the BBC for a long time, um, and then more recently on Channel 4, which has been very productive, and most recently on Channel 5, which has brought some success. Um, our team was across in Washington in January at Real Screen, trying to make relationships with PBS and uh, Smithsonian Channel and things like that for the first time. Um, uh, but, you know... How, th how thinly do you spread yourselves if you take your, your eye off the um, opportunities that Channel 4 is offering because you want to get into America? You know, so um, w there's potential for dialogue with, for instance, Apple, because Jay Hunt, who was at Channel 4, is now running Apple. So there are relationships that people have that they had through Channel 4 there. That's how it works. You know, it's the personal relationships. So um, we've all got our fingers crossed as far as that's concerned. The targets that the screen unit have got are, are, are pretty ambitious and they're challenging. The, the doubling of uh, the sector um, over a period of time, uh, I think it's the right target or it's, a, it's an economically driven target. And the only way that that, I think, is going to be achieved is by having a, a very international focus and by using the funding of the screen unit as, as leverage to bring uh, um, production and, and creativity to the fore in, in, in Scotland, but with very much an international footprint. Um, one of the things that we do, probably um, not as much as we could, but we, we do uh, some work with Northern Ireland Screen, for example, and SDI to bring people to the content markets, uh, pr pr producers. And it's those kind of networks that do bear fruit uh, in, in the long term. So sending your, you know, David sending team to Washington and that is absolutely where the investment uh, ha has to happen. Um, it does spread resources very thinly and people are busy in production and finding the time to, to develop uh, not just creative ideas but develop the business networks and the trust that leads to commissions is, is a, a work of a period of time and needs to be, needs to be strategised but it does bear fruit and our own experience has been that you know, five years ago in, in the Gaelic television sector, um, we were quite a self-sufficient kind of economy in that we had, we had money to commission and we commissioned it, we spent it, we thought wisely and the producers <coughs> did a great job of making good television content. Um, now those same producers are bringing a whole load of other people to the table uh, to, to work with us. So we're looking at portfolio projects that involve funding from Canada to China. Um, and that's different. It's a... It's a it's it's the work of the last few years, but it is the right direction of travel. That's quite interesting points because if you were 
a manufacturing company or, or a, a food and drink company, I'd imagine there would be support from Scottish Enterprise would be the economic driver for this. Where, as a sector, have, do you feel you've been receiving support and where do you expect it to come from in the future? Would it, is it the screen unit? Is it the Scottish Enterprise need to play a greater role here within uh, the film and TV sector? Companies. So Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google uh, are—they have no end of suitors. You know, everybody wants to play with them because they—they they have deep pockets. And they don't actually always pay very well, and I think you know we—we we have to be quite careful about rights positions in that that world because they do take everything, um, and you have to make sure as a company they're paying you a sufficient amount of money to actually make the project and you know survive into the next project. Um, but they're, what they are interested in is good ideas and the talent to make them. So. Yes, it's about development, so that would be a Creative Scotland screen unit uh, area, I would have thought. Yes, it's about access to markets and meeting people, so that's, that's Scottish Enterprise. But I think also the domestic broadcasters have a role to play in this, because they are very well-trusted co-signatories of a lot of the FANG deals. Um, you know, if you are a good supplier to Channel 4, a good supplier to the BBC, you have the trust and respect of a very well-respected broadcaster, and that gives the FANG companies a lot of comfort. So working with the national broadcasters to access those companies I think is quite a useful route but they have no end of suitors you know it's not an easy thing to get into actually finding time with any anybody from any of those companies is is tricky sticking with the, the screen unit for a moment when we took evidence from the public bodies from Scottish Enterprise Creative Scotland SES etc um, there was some concern raised off the the back of that session in fact it was raised during that session with a number of us on social media um, that these the public bodies were taking a leadership role within the screen unit without the relevant industry experienced professionals within that and that industry experienced professionals such as yourselves um, would not have the leadership within that screen unit that was actually required to make it a success that those making the the ultimate decisions in, in regards to the unit um would not have the, the level of knowledge required is that a concern that you've heard is that one that you share what do you think the governance arrangements around the screen unit should be speaking as one who's on on the on the sub board um it, it it's a big sub board um, there's two of us from the industry and there's quite a lot of people from the public agencies. We shall see how our voices are heard when it all starts. Um, there is an issue, uh, if I may, that, that I would raise with um, <clears throat> particularly the Scottish Enterprise side of public agencies, which is that they, they measure success in terms of job creation. Um, we do create jobs, but most of them are freelance jobs and they tend not to count. And they're substantial high value jobs and they're pretty well continuous you know we may have an office full of 50 people um they come and they go but but they're you know there's a if, if we can get it right in the development side then we've got a, a decent steady flow of that but if they don't count um and therefore we don't quali qualify for some of the support that we would like to see is an investment in plant and infrastructure and so on which would otherwise have to be taken away from our development which is what generates new jobs that's a problem I think you could probably draw a degree of comfort from the fact that the Screen Sector Leadership Group report uh, was chaired by John McCormick and, and, and was actually, I think, pretty well received by, by, the, by the industry and uh, that, it, that it hit most, most, if not all, of the right points and the right tone. As I said earlier, you know, the, the key, key thing at the moment is uh, the funding rules that are going to be applied to the new pots of money that they have and how those are developed. And I, I appreciate David's uh, involved in that process, but you know, we would like to see wider industry consultation so that all kind of points of view, all genres can consider how they would impact upon them. Um, and to move to another area entirely, um, David, you mentioned, uh, I think, in answer to the first question from the convener, um, information that you had drawn from the, the register and that you could only draw so much from it. And then it was a bit of educated guesswork involved in getting to the, the conclusions you need. If the goal here is to create the level of transparency that results in industry confidence and audience confidence, what information should be part of the, the registers that are published? It's a good, good question. I meant to mention this earlier. So at the moment, every title is listed. Uh, so an individual 10-minute film is given the same way as a 15-part series. Uh, it's a title that's, that's set against the register. So we, have no, uh, we, we know we can go back and check to see how many episodes there were in each series. But the actual weight of things is, is not there. So... 
I think the out of 100 registers should at the very least list the number of episodes in each commission uh, and their duration so that we know what, what's there. Um, it's difficult to say, f to provide financial detail um, because the, it's commercially confidential and there's, there's a real question there around you know, the, the, the broadcaster's ability to negotiate. You know, they have to be able to negotiate with us um, with a, you know, without revealing too much of their hand as we do. And it's, you know, that's a commercial uh, relationship. At the same point, I think more f broad financial information could be provided as to how the overall spend is broken down between companies based within different parts of the UK uh, without necessarily naming the companies or, or, or setting you know, too much information financially, but you know, proportionally, we know what Channel 4, the BBC spends in the nations and regions. How much, you break that down for us in a bit more detail. Grant, and um, just on the, the complaints procedures already been mentioned somewhat and mentioned that um, it could do with being a bit more robust if you have a, an outstanding complaint of uh, over a year, or around a year. Beyond the complaints procedure though, I mean, what regulatory tools can Ofcom actually bring to bear? to create the kind of sustainable industry growth that, that we want to see? Because it's th there's that kind of carrot and stick balance that I think you mentioned earlier on about if, if you're using punitive measures that fine companies, then that's not going to result in any sustainable industry growth in the following year. So what tools can actually be brought to bear there? Regulation is, is um, a blunt tool and not always an effective tool. I mean, ask the National Health Service about nurses who were there to tick the box for being seen within A&E within a certain period because they took your name and wrote it down on a bit of paper or something like that. Um, we, we have to change the culture, and I'm not sure that we do that just by regulation. We have to change the behaviours, we have to change the assumptions and the expectations, and that's a big job. It's been going on for a long time, um, and it's, it's difficult to do with, with commissioners whose first priority is the programmes and who regard the obligations to have a sea change in the way commissioning is happening as an irritation. Um, so um, I think I think it's it's a it, how do we achieve culture change? I, I don't know what the answer is, but it's by it's by drawing around us people who get it. Mm -hmm. um, it's by telling stories um, and making people realise that doesn't work. I think Ofcom can also ask for um, plans. So it uh, has asked the BBC for an annual plan uh, in advance of each year, and I think by setting out a plan about how you intend to achieve certain quotas, uh, it allows. Um, you know, a, a more constructive or a, or a constructive approach to how to, how to how to how to address issues, and I think issues can be addressed earlier that stage rather than retrospectively, you know, f using audit. There are bigger other there are changing moves. So Channel 4's current plan to move 300 jobs outside of London uh, to establish three centres outside of London, one of which will be its national headquarters. That's going to locate, we we are told, uh, commissioners within the nations and regions. Um, it's you know that then they become part of the community that produces content in those those locations. It, it becomes more authentic as a result uh, because they get to know the people that live and work in those areas, and they get to trust them, and they can see what they've done before. Um, you know, if you're if everyone's based in London, everybody buys programs is based in London. I'm not talking about obviously BBC Scotland and uh, local broadcasters. I'm talking about the network broadcasters. Then the, it becomes a harder process. You're not part of that community. Um, I think Channel 4's move, obviously prompted, prompted by DCA, DCMS and not Ofcom, is a re really um, positive move, and their reaction to the, the requirement that was placed upon them uh, has been positive. It's a new regime within Channel 4. We wait to see how they take everything forward, but it's a, it's a good first step. And I, you know, I'm told that Glasgow is, is keen to put its hat in the ring. Thank you. Can I ask a, 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 bit, a little bit about the portrayal of Scotland? Because although it's not a public purpose in the same way as support for the creative industries in the nations, region, nations and regions is a public purpose, uh, certainly representing the diversity of the United Kingdom, I understand is. And I know that, Mr Campbell, you have raised issues around the accurate portrayal uh, of Scotland uh, in the past and indeed Ofcom uh, talked about it as it's going to be part of their review of the BBC uh, going forward. I wondered if you were able to reflect on whether you think the current regulatory framework is delivering, delivering sufficient programming uh, that portrays Scotland uh, and also what measures could be implemented by Ofcom, the broadcasters or the screen unit to encourage the portrayal of Scotland in commission programmes. 
Mm. Um, it's a, I, I'm not sure there's there's a, a method which can can, can currently you know, me measure that um, success. I think people have a wide range of views and on on portrayal um, and wh where it, where it's where it's failing and where it, where it's where it's actually working. Um, and I think sometimes um, you know you, you can point to, I suppose maybe re recent successes or recent uh, instances such as the the Shetland series on on the BBC, which is which is a network. So it's basically it's allowing you to you know to see um, uh, for people across the UK to experience in their own way part of you know what, what um, you know what it's like to be to be somewhere else and, and live somewhere else, you know regardless of the story that that's that's underlying it. So. Um, uh, I'm not sure there's any uh, current kind of methodology, though, that's, that actually gives us a kind of a, a, a picture that everyone would agree with. I think okay. the emergence of the new BBC Scotland's interesting in this regard. You know, uh, for the first time we have a, a national broadcaster that has a fixed linear timetable. Uh, it broadcasts every day from 7 till 12. Um, it's going to be commissioning a lot of content. It may not always be able to fully fund that content. It, you know, we're we're conscious at the moment that their budget levels are lower than we would hope. And you know, obviously, we've talked in this this forum before about BBC licence fee reinvestment and how we hope that there can be more money brought into the Scottish system f by the BBC. Uh, but what it, that does, the pressure does deliver, is co-commissioning between BBC Scotland and the BBC Network. Um, so you're going to see more projects, I hope, move to be funded at the outset between different parts of the BBC. Um, so they play on the BBC Scotland channel, they play within the network. Um, but also, you know, the more movement of BBC Scotland commissioned programmes to get network slots. Um, they're, without blowing our own trumpet too much, we, uh, Matchlight made a programme that was broadcast on Monday night on BBC Two in Scotland about the, the Masons uh, and the history of the Masons. It had a, a almost 20% share, so one in five people in Scotland were watching it. Now that would seem like a who were watching TV at that point in time. Um, that would seem like a, 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 an example of a programme that could move to the network. Now, we benefit from that as a company because there's a small network uplift payment that, that's made, um, which is useful financially, but it also allows for a degree of representation. But your projects have to be good enough. You, know, you, you have to be able to, to play on the national stage with an idea and a, and a subject that kind of punches through nationally. And I think that leads on to another area that we haven't covered, but I wanted to raise it. I realise some of you have to go very promptly, and I, but I wanted to make sure this was covered because it's been raised a lot um, with the committee, which is the relationship between uh, commissioners and uh, and production companies in the, the sector. Uh, and what we've been told is that um, because if the commissioners in London um, the, the relationships are with people in London that they trust. Uh, and that's a very difficult thing to change. I mean, how can we go about changing that? Are there regulations that we can put in place that force a change there? Not so much regulations, um, catalysts, um, because um, commissioners are resentful of anything that looks like their hand is being overly forced. Um, I think we're all capable of building those relationships. David has them, we have them. Um, it's, it's just a question of resources and time. But partly in answer to your last question, um, the, um, the representation thing, um, a story that illustrates it, is that after Derry Girls was on Channel 4, we suddenly had interest in something that we thought we'd never have before, which is History of the Troubles <clears throat> from our Northern Ireland office. And there tends to be an assumption that something that's got a regional accent on it won't travel. Um, Derry Girls had a very strong regional accent on it, and it was very attractive to an audience, and that kind of surprised the commissioners. So suddenly they're thinking, ooh, maybe this will work. So who knows, it could have a rollout effect on Scotland. Okay. <coughs> London is the, is the other answer. You know, Channel 4's move to put place commissioners in the nations and regions it is a big step forward. The BBC could be doing more of that at network level, already has a few. But you have to, as we've said in this forum before, you have to distinguish between a commissioner and a conduit to commissioner. You know, somebody that gets in the way of a commission, potentially another link in the chain, is not useful. Somebody that has the direct ear of the, the channel controller is useful. That's something that's been a bit confusing in terms of the evidence that we've heard at the committee, that we're told there's a drama commissioner in BBC Scotland, but other people say that's actually not happened and that the commissioner in, within BBC Scotland doesn't actually have the clout in London. You need to ask the BBC uh, for more details on that. My understanding is that the, 
you know, if you want to win a drama commission, you need the head of drama in London to, to green light it and the controller of, of the, na the National Network Channel. Um, so that person who sits in Scotland will be a commissioner or a commissioning editor, but they will not have the power to directly green light anything. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, and just one last question. And, um, you, we, I think there's, there's a fair amount of consensus that there are problems in terms of the commissioning process and, and the amount of Scottish content that's getting onto the screen. And even, you know, Ofcom have agreed that that's, there's a, a problem there. Uh, but when we took evidence from the De Deputy Director General, Anne Bulford, uh, in October 2017, uh, about the, the whole process of establishing uh, Scottish content. Uh, she said, across the whole UK, we check line by line through the returns against the criteria for the base of the production company and the percentages of people to ensure that does not happen. And she was very robust in defending uh, the BBC, but you know everyone else that we've taken evidence from, and indeed the Screen Sector Leadership Group itself, were saying that there's clearly a problem here. Um, do you think there's an issue there that the, direct, the Deputy Director General uh, of the BBC doesn't recognise a problem that everybody else has said exists? It's funny how um, problems become apparent. Um, I heard Peter Murrell saying that he had seen a drama crew sitting on the steps of their house in um, Charlotte Square um, and he just it was late at night and he had engaged in a conversation with them and was asking them what it was like and so on. And some of them had said, oh, it's terrible. I've got to find a granny here with an address so as I can tick the Scottish box. Wrong person to say that to, I may say. Um, uh, and, and, uh, but, you know, if, if, if that happens and the production company is told that the box has been ticked and the production company tells the BBC that the box has been ticked, it's quite hard for somebody like Anne Bulford to, to know um, because all the information that she's getting through the chain is is that it is working but you know we have to tell these stories in order to um change the system what, what, is, and what is not a substantive base you know that's that's the key question they're they're, they're happy to accept that a, a temporary office with a production executive in it is a substantive base because as the rules are currently set up that's allowable uh, so you need, we need to think about what should be a substantive base um when it comes to actual personnel involved in a project where are they paying their taxes Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all of our witnesses uh, in panel one today uh, for coming to give evidence to us. And we shall now have a short break while we change our panel of witnesses. Thank you.
Good morning, welcome back. Uh, we continue with our second panel of witnesses on television commissioning. Uh, from BBC Scotland, Steve Carson, Head of Multi-Platform Commissioning, and Bruce Malcolm, Head of the Service Department. From Channel 4, Lorraine McKechnie, the Nations and Regions Executive, and Sophie jo Jones, Head of Corporate Affairs, and Bobby Hain, uh, Director of Channels STV. Welcome, thank you for coming to give evidence to us today. Uh, now, I, I believe you were all here for for the, the first panel of witnesses, which was uh, great. So I wonder if you, you could reflect on uh, some of the evidence we heard there in terms of the Ofcom review, um, whether the regulations on uh, ensuring that uh, Scot Scottish uh, creative industries were benefiting uh, from the regulations that are in place at the moment, how the regulations need to change, and indeed compliance with the regulations, because we had quite a lot of evidence that clearly there were breaches in what was being determined to be a Scottish production. Who would like to go first? I'm happy to speak on behalf of yes. the BBC. So, so I did listen to all that. I, I think it would be useful, perhaps, if we put some context on it. So what I would like to do is start with where the BBC has been and where it's going, in a sense. So. When, when I look back uh, over, since 2004, we've tripled network production in Scotland. So by any business standard, that's a big, big expansion. So some people think we went too slow, some people we went too fast, but we have tripled the production in Scotland. We've also launched or will launch two new channels, the only two new channels the BBC has launched in Scotland, BBC Alba and the new channel in the new year. That new channel plus the new network production is about another £40 million pounds of business. So I think... The context I would like to go over is we've been in a journey. We have been in a big journey here. We're in a different position than we were 10 years ago, different position from five, and a different position from three. So, And we've still got work to do. We realise that. But to achieve that level of growth so quickly has meant that we've done a number of things. But what the BBC did back when Mark Thompson made his announcement was say that we would spend 8% or 8.6% of all network production in Scotland. Now that, that's an economic measure, and I'll keep coming back to that. But basically, what Mark said was we spend 8.6 percent, and that's what we do, and we've exceeded that target. But, I mean, me. For intervening, but if you heard the evidence that that was led there, there were questions as to whether that 8 percent actually was authentic uh, Scottish uh, content, or it was it was done through lift and shift, it was done through yeah. a temporary executive and independent production company. Clearly, and some you heard some of the examples that were raised. And this isn't just that one hour panel. We've obviously, you'll be aware that of the evidence that the committee and previous committees like the Select Committee in Westminster have taken on this issue before, that basically what's been classified as a Scottish production is not a Scottish production. Hopefully I'll get to that convener in, yeah. in due course. But, if, uh, but uh, with the 8.6%, that means what the BBC is saying is that all television, all network television, that's sport, that's children's, that's daytime, that's quizzes, that's factual, that's drama, that's comedy. We are saying we will make 8.6% of all these genres. As a result of that, it's it will be a mix of content. There'll be a mix of content, of network content that we make across the country, yeah? Some of it will be drama, some of it will be comedy, which we'll talk a bit more about. Steve will talk to you about where we've, where we've evolved there. Uh, but it is an economic measure, and it is stuff. So a couple of examples might help. So we talk about Sunset and Vine. I know there's been questions about the, the, the Women's FA Cup final. Sunset and Vine, I believe, are a great company to be based in Scotland. They've got a great office. They've done work over maybe a decade for us. They cover Shinty, the Bowls, football, rugby. They cover BT with award-winning football coverage. So they're a great company. They make great stuff. Uh, what they've also done is some win some work outside of Scotland, yeah? So they do make stuff outside of Scotland. And what the BBC has to do under the Ofcom rules is badge that as having come from a specific place, yeah? Uh, we think they've got a base in Scotland, a meaningful base. They've employed apprentices. They did the Commonwealth Games with us, for instance. So the sort of question, and there isn't a right and a wrong here, is what do we think of Sunset and Vine's presence? Do we want, should we be proud of that company exporting their, their skills and their expertise and making content elsewhere and therefore accept that that is one of the productions that will be badged as from Scotland or not? Yeah, that, that's, that's that question. It has qualified because I think that is a meaningful production in a sense. Yeah, Other people have got a different view. If you go on to some of the stuff earlier, some of the studio stuff we were talking about, we made a big decision quite a long time ago to build a studio at Pacific Key. To feed that studio and keep the hundreds of people busy round about that studio means that we need to utilise and put an, a volume of work through that studio on a regular basis. 
that that means lift and shift, that means eggheads, but it also means a, a whole set of other productions like Children in Need, it means Mrs Brown's Boys. Again, there's the question, is that good production for Scotland to do with hundreds of people gaining skills and experience and wages being paid and mortgages being paid? So we think that's a good thing. Huh? We accept it doesn't mean portrayal, we accept it doesn't mean representation in some cases, but if you want to make 8% of all the BBC's network production and play a part in that, you have to accept that there's a, there's a mix of work involved. I think it's the right decision for Scotland that we've got a studio. I think it's the right decision that Channel 4, STV and ourselves utilise that studio. Without that, we wouldn't have a studio. We wouldn't make game shows. We wouldn't make entertainment. But it does mean that some shows qualify, which some people might say, couldn't it be better? Couldn't it be a drama? Or couldn't it be this? Or couldn't it be that? I, I think we all have to accept there's, there's a difference between economics and Ofcom measures. Ofcom only measure the economics, yeah, and portrayal and representation, and, and finding a clever way to measure portrayal is is is, is a topic that we should discuss. On the, some of the stuff earlier, we do comply both before a production is made and after. If we receive any question, we we take these complaints or issues seriously. We do look at the returns that the production company makes. We do audit them when asked to do it, and we do our own review of them. We do have a lot of knowledge in this area. Yeah, uh, uh, when we do review, they do meet the criteria that Ofcom set in, in most occasions. Whether these criteria could be tightened, improved, made slightly better is for discussion. I, I, I think they maybe can, yeah, but we, we comply as required to, uh, 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 and that's the way that the system works. Uh, the last thing I'll say is in the sort of what I term the peripatetic productions. There are a lot of productions that move about the country and use staff and you know people from all over the country. And the measure for that is substantive base. So the key measure is substantive base and whether a company has a substantive base and where that substantive base is. Uh, uh, that is the question that, that, that we have to answer for Sunset and Vine, for, for any of the companies we're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. So we feel we qualify what we have to qualify, but I'll, I'll stop there and pause for anything else. Okay, um, <laughs> move on to Claire Baker. Uh, Claire uh, Baker. Thank you, convener. It's just a, a quick question in relation to the Ofcom review. Um, I suppose, are the panel... I, I accept the argument that the channels are working within the rules that Ofcom currently set, but is the panel supportive of a change to the rules? I don't know if you're able to say that, given Ofcom's role as a regulator. And would a change in the rules make it, I suppose particularly for the BBC and Bruce Malcolm's comments, if the rules were to substantially change, would it present challenges for the studio that is based um, at Pacific, sorry, not Pacific Key, uh, um, it's Pacific Keys. The, the studio, would it present challenges for the viability of the studio at Pacific Key if there was to be substantial changes, or do you think there would be enough flexibility within any new rules? But are you supportive of a change in the way in which Ofcom uh, regulate this this area? Uh, um, speaking for Channel Four, I mean, I, I, just to set the scene a little bit, bit for for us. I mean, it, a year ago or so, we were we were here, and I think the consultation about um, Channel Four's future contribution to nations and regions and what more we could do had just kicked off. So, um, very pleasing to be sitting here today, uh, nearly a year later, and we've just announced um, a very major, um, in fact, the biggest single shift in the way we operate um, in the, in the last couple of weeks. And at the heart of that is a renewed commitment by us to increase our commitment to commissioning from the nations and regions from the current quota of 35% to 50% in the next few years. Um, and we're very excited about that. We're going to support that um, objective, which is right at the heart of our, our for all um, the UK plan, with the opening of three new creative hubs. The location of those is yet to be determined. But that marks a very significant shift in our commitment to ensuring that we are investing our money far and wide right across the UK. Um, and I mention that because I think it forms a really important backdrop to the big question that I think we're here to talk about, which is how do we support and catalyse an increase in, in commissioning and creative activity right across the UK and including in Scotland? Um, and that's the primary objective that we are working to here. I think that, you know, the quotas are an important part of that, but they are not the sole solution to whether or not we are meeting that big objective of driving regional economic growth. I think, as, as has also been alluded to, an important point with the quotas is to identify and be really clear about what they are there to do. 
and they are there to support economic activity. And the portrayal question, I think, is a, a really important parallel question, and we mustn't lose sight of that. Um, and when it comes to the to the quotas themselves and how they are how they are structured, I mean, we have um, extremely robust processes internally. Um, we we look at projects before they're given the green light. We keep track of that throughout. We regularly have external review um, of our programmes to ensure that they are meeting both the spirit and the letter of what the regulations demand. Um, but I think the important metric to look at in terms of their effectiveness is are they are, is the system as a whole delivering the objective we want, and that's an increase in economic activity and investment. And when we look at our performance there, um, you know, I think we are really pleased to see that through the combination of the quotas, a lot of the work that Lorraine and the team we have based in Glasgow do, um, and our own, you know, sort of, uh, corporate objectives, we've seen very significant increase over the last 10 years, so fourfold increase in our spend in Scotland in the last four years. And when we come to publish our figures for 2017, um, we'll see a very substantial jump of about 25% in our investment in, in Scotland. So taken as a whole, we think the system seems to be working, looking at actually what is happening in terms of the range of companies we're, we're investing in and the amount of, of money that, that is um, supporting that. Yeah, I mean, we recognise the increase in, in spend, which is welcome, but will the creative hubs, I think earlier you did say the creative hub, the intention would be there would also be um, increased regional content and increased portrayal, because the quotas at the moment, if they are worked uh, to the letter, except everybody here is saying that we uh, abide by the quota rules, the quota allows that kind of flexibility where you might base a hub in Glasgow or Manchester, but the content, you could be filming a, a, re a national game show that takes place in Glasgow, but doesn't have any reflection on of Scotland within it so the current rules would allow you to do that is that the did, but I think you said that the hubs you would intend there to be a greater while it would create regional economic benefit there would also be regional content linked to that although at the moment that doesn't um, mean that you have to match the Ofcom rules so, so the hubs, um, the, of which there'll be three, um, and there'll be a, a pitch process in, in, that we'll publish in the coming weeks to identify that, will for the first time put real creative decision-making power into the nations and regions. Um, and that is a very significant step and I think is a, is a subject that you know, we've discussed in, in this forum before and elsewhere. So that will, that will mark a very significant shift, not only for Channel 4, but actually in, in the, the weight of commissioning um, power across all UK broadcasting commissioning. Um, and you know, we are absolutely determined that, that that new structure will help catalyse and underpin the growth in commissioning expenditure. Alongside that, we are also working to an objective that, that the new Nations and Regions plan that we have developed, outside of what the quotas are there formally to do, will also help us deliver to, to our remit for diversity, and within that, uh, regional and national diversity, by ensuring that more programmes contain a more diverse range of viewpoints and people from across the country. Now, often programmes commissioned from a particular location will strongly represent that location, but we also want the creative flexibility to say that actually if something's made in Scotland, it doesn't necessarily have to be deeply Scottish in what goes on screen, and equally we want our programming to reflect the diversity of the UK wherever it's made. Um, an example of that is um, in January this year, Channel 4 News, as you may know, opened a new bureau in Glasgow. Part of our Nations and Regions plan is also to bolster the number of regional bureau that Channel 4 News has and the objective there is to ensure that we are able on a daily basis to have more regional diversity uh, as a matter of course in, in our Channel 4 News output albeit one reaching a, a national audience. Can I give an example of, of where we are now and, and, and where we've come from so I think where we are now in the sort of second phase of moving spend out of London is portrayal is now coming through strongly um, and on our, on our drama story for example I think actually just picking up on what Miss Hamilton said, uh, you know, we've the past few weeks greenlit Shetland series five. There's a uh, new titles been announced, The Cry, which is from a, an indigenous Scottish indie set here on, on, in Australia. Um, STB productions are becoming a major drama player for, for the BBC with the victim and Elizabeth is missing. Our comedy slate, we've got some of the biggest comedies on the BBC and Two Doors Down and, uh, and Still Game. So I, I think that has been a, a sort of a progression to, to portrayal. In defence of so-called lift and shift, uh, from my experience in Northern Ireland, um, I think if you know when broadcasters were serious about getting spend out of London, rather than wait several years for a development pipeline, they move specific titles. Some titles that were moved to Belfast, for example, 
one series is, is One to Down Under, which is 30 episodes a year of a show that's actually set in Australia and New Zealand, but made from Belfast. And I could see in my time there, you know, with the talent pipeline that came through, people who started as runners or assistant producers, producers, after three or four years. Um, what also happened was that the showrunners, the series producers, who maybe early years were fly-ins, so-called, you know, by the end of that, all the network titles were run by local people. And, you know, you were beginning to begin a sector where if you wanted to work in network television, you know, you could do it from Belfast, whereas in my generation, your next question was, well, you know, when does the next boat leave? So there was economic impact there, but clearly the big win is in portrayal. And, uh, you know, certainly in Scotland, as I said there, you can see that come through. It's interesting, if I could just back to Mr Carson on the Northern Ireland question, because we, we visited Northern Ireland and uh, we took evidence from an independent production company there uh, who had lots of positive things uh, to say, but they did say it was almost impossible to get a network commission from the BBC. They, they, they were actually they were winning prizes at international festivals in, in New York. They were more likely to get a commission from Netflix or NBC than they were from the BBC network. The picture of Northern Ireland is, is mixed in drama and in children's. There was a huge amount of activity against some of the biggest uh, dramas in BBC Two came, came from Northern Ireland during, during my time. Factual had remained a, a problem. One of the fixes we did with that as the BBC as a whole was broker partnerships with Northern Ireland Screen, which, which I could talk, talk about if you like. Uh, Northern Ireland Screen then, for example, injected money into, into factual production to help close that gap. There's some so strong that. entertainment companies in Northern Ireland. Stellify, for example, were doing well. Mr. Heen. I'm just going to offer a couple of observations on your question about the first session and regulation in general. I think it's absolutely true that it was described earlier as a blunt instrument, but there is some effectiveness to even that bluntness. And the, the parallel I would draw is, for example, the point that was made around the BBC's um, intention, uh, uh, their own stated intention to... Uh, commission programmes by volume and value commensurate with population, leaving aside the question of detail that's been raised as to line by line per programme. But if you contrast that with uh, the ITV network, for example, which has no uh, nation's quota within its licence and could, I think has actually gone for a whole year without making a single programme in Scotland for the network, that gives you a sense of the, the requirement of regulation at some level as part of the solution. But I think that the second point I'd make is it's clear that the, the kind of nations and regions picture, which is an echo of television past, is not a sophisticated enough regulatory instrument to bring about what I think are three different outcomes. Industrial policy of making any kind of programme around the country with a dispersal of production generally. Secondly, uh, ensuring that there is portrayal and representation at some cultural level from areas where those programmes are made and uh, the areas that they reflect. And thirdly, a much more difficult point, which is around how do you ensure that there is disbursement of investment? In other words, that the the creation of IP, as David Strachan called it, is, is also mirrored with dispersed investment and dispersed growth around the country and doesn't return to a smaller pocket of, um, you know, geographical pocket of, of investment and returns, which is London-based. And the final point I'd make, which came up earlier on, is around co-regulation. And I think there are two very successful models that Ofcom has followed, which go to the provenance of data and the responsibility of industry operators. And the first is the advertising co-regulation, where the, the regulation of advertising is shared by an industry body and by Ofcom itself, and that Ofcom is not concerned initially with day-by-day uh, issues raised by advertising. They will come to Ofcom eventually, but they're actually dealt with by the industry body uh, first and foremost. And secondly, uh, the initial uh, setup of the on-demand programme service, the VOD services, which Ofcom uh, had an arm's length agency work with the, with the industry uh, to get off the ground. And I think that's now come into Ofcom actually because of the growth in services like Netflix and Amazon and the the amount of viewing that they now represent, they've become regulated by Ofcom. But I think the early days of that particular structure are a good pointer to how, and it was a question from, from the committee, is there a co-regulatory model that relies as much on the industry as it does on the regulator? Right. Although some of the suggestions that you put there would require legislation at a UK level. 
Um, so um, we are in the situation at the moment where Ofcom have, have been given additional powers to regulate uh, uh, the BBC in particular. So I guess um, our focus is on seeing how that works out and uh, how how the review, whether how the review is going to be effective or not. Um, I'll move on to Richard Lockhead. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, I've got two questions. The first question uh, relates to the decision-making process and I'd like to hear from the BBC, but also Channel 4 in light of your proposal to create three creative hubs, which the previous panel warmly welcomed, so it sounds like good news. But in terms of actual decision-making power over budgets, quite clearly, if the ideas are created in the hubs and you know, the work begins there, they've got to be paid for. And I just want to understand how the decision-making uh, decision uh, framework will work in terms of the influence of these creative hubs. Maybe we can start with Channel 4 and I'll go to BBC. Um, uh, thank you. Well, th there is a lot of work to be to be done to to get into the detail of exactly how the, the creative hubs are are going to work. But as I say, one of the you know really significant shifts that that is I I within this plan and is very much about ensuring that there is a greater degree of decision making power transferred from London to the nations and regions is that the people who are in these three creative hubs will be decision makers when it comes to our to commissioning, and that is that is a first. So uh, Lorraine and, and um, Deborah, who are based in Glasgow, are absolutely integral to a lot of the work we've done around building up talent, supporting companies on their growth trajectory. But they don't have <laughs> commissioning power, so that that will be a significant shift, and those people will hold real budgets and real com real commissioning decision. Now, commissioning as a whole is a collaborative process where, of course, you've got a schedule or a set of schedules, and you have a number of different genres, different uh, um, obligations that, that we have to meet you know we have a remit that asks us to do 15 different things um, and within that a set of regulations of which nations and region in, regions commissioning is is one part um, so exactly <coughs> how the opportunities will pan out for Scottish production companies as well as any other production companies will still need to be part of that sort of overall commissioning process to to fill the schedule and of course, we have to fill our schedules in a way that is both commercially optimised, because we are entirely commercially funded, and in a way that supports our publisher model, where we don't have in-house production in the way that, that colleagues uh, alongside us here do. We are trying to also balance... Um, you know, commissioning all of that from external production companies and ensuring that we're working with a diverse range of production companies. And we're very clear that although the regulations don't formally require it of us, we hold ourselves to a high standard to ensure that we are working with a whole, a whole range of different people. And, you know, we heard from some of those in the, in the previous panel. So there are a number of sort of complex bits of the jigsaw at, at play. But the short answer to your question, I think, is, is absolutely that this marks a very significant transition in the way we operate in c creative decisions and budgets being held by commissioning people outside London. I Do you want to? Yeah, I think what also is necessary to flag up is that Channel 4 is actually quite a small company. The commissioning floor is small. There's different genres and each team is made up of six to eight people with a head of department. So you've always got people to talk to about ideas. So I think having decision makers in the different hubs is great, but you will always work within your team anyway, but it is a very collaborative environment to work in. Okay. If I can maybe turn to BBC, because clearly we'll have to wait the detail from Channel 4, but it sounds like it's hopefully going in the right direction. Uh, in terms of the BBC, is it ultimately the situation that, irrespective of all the good things that are happening with BBC, uh, BBC Scotland and the devolving of more budgets and, and so on, that the commissioning process ultimately will still be decided in London. That's my first question. And my second question is, I think it's unlikely that if Queen of the South are playing Morton in the fourth round of the Scottish Cup, that that be broadcast into television rooms in England and Wales. But yet, an addition of Shetland was dumped for the Swansea City versus Sheffield Wednesday FA Cup replay in February where the stadium was half empty, so even the local people didn't want to watch that match, never mind people in Scotland who were expecting to watch Shetland. Uh, do you not agree that that gives the impression all the decisions are taken in London about what happens with the BBC? Picture is a, is a mix, is, 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 is the honest answer. So uh, locally, within the reorganisation of BBC Scotland, all commissioning decisions across radio, television, and digital services are obviously taken in. 
Scotland by myself and a, and a team of commissioners. Uh, network commissioning works. Uh, there's, there's no commissioner in any system that is a, is a single tick. Uh, it's a minimum of two. So in Scotland, there's the, the genre commissioner in my team and myself. Um, in Scotland, looking at drama, for example, and I, I just would like to correct the record on that. So there's a network drama commissioner, Gainer, in Glasgow, who we, we work closely with. Glasgow, uh, Gainer and Liz have a daily direct contact to the head of drama peers. Uh, and then the final tick there in that system is obviously the channel controller. And as you can see in the, in the drama slate, we run through Shetland to cry, Elizabeth is missing, uh, the victim, Cleek. There's, there's, there's a very strong drama slate now, now coming from Scotland. Um, the FA Cup final replay, uh, the FA Cup uh, replay you mentioned is, is emblazoned in my heart. Um, is that the one that went to penalties? Um, I switched <laughs> off. <laughs> yes. Um, clearly, the BBC is a pan UK organisation. The FA Cup rights are, are purchased on a pan UK uh, basis. Um, I think Chatham wasn't dumped, it was actually moved uh, with River City to, to, to Wednesday. So, I mean, that, that, you know, these are, you know, the realities of, you know, you are putting local content into you know, national services. I think subject to regulatory approval, the channel environment will, you know, will, will help us in that regard. So did BBC Scotland say anything about the FA Cup replay happening and having at the Scottish well, programme? Well, we do. We, we look at those in the schedule and again, particularly where they potentially can go to penalties and time shift everything, including the 10 o'clock news. Um, you know, with, during the recent uh, weather conditions, we made provisions for if it did overrun, how we would get local weather, for example, on air. Uh, so we, we do work closely in the scheduling terms with them as well. OK, I'm not sure that answers the question because... Well, I, I do think we do communicate with them, yes. So yes. we do talk to whether we opt or whether we stay with the network. Uh, and that's on a case-by-case -case basis. And we'll do it before and review afterwards, yes. Uh, and it's not one size fits all on the answer. I don't know what the issues were in this particularly, whether Shetland could have went out in Scotland and not in the UK, whether that would have given the plot away or something like that, for instance. There are always a set of pros and cons as to whether you do or don't go with it, yeah. On that occasion, we went with the FA Cup match. I know, I know there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of comment about that, uh, whether we could have actually kept Shetland on and shown in Scotland and not the rest of the UK is 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 a point for drama commissioners us and everyone else to debate. But I suspect there was something about the, the series and the plot, etc., that wanted to get across the UK at the same time. OK, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I suspect Tab Scott yeah, wants okay. to come in there. Yeah, I'll get the MSP for Shetland. Uh, I think it's only right that he gets to come in at this moment. I'm very grateful to Richard for, for raising it. I was just simply going to say I'm very glad it does go out across the whole of the UK because that's the point of that, how successful it's been. Four and a half million people watched the last one the other night. And my understanding is that rather more than watched the football that night because it was a dreadful game of football too because I did watch it, but only because... Anyway, there's no point. But can I just ask... Uh, quite, can I just ask Steve Carson? Firstly, thank you for, for commissioning another series of that. It's got that got announced a huge acclaim at home on the other the other night but can you just describe why that why you have decided to do that because it might be more important to deal with the, the important aspects of why you've commissioned another series of that and is it also related to netflix because i understand that show is being syndicated not just around europe but also by vast organizations in this case such as netflix and formally, how important is that in the decision surely well formally the commissioning decision for another series of shetland would be made by network bbc drama of which gainer would be a central part of that uh, that's an interesting example of where we can play and we want to continue to play a role as a sort of a pipeline for development. Shetland was initially a BBC Scotland only commission, as was Still Game, for example. And, you know, we've got some strong examples there, and that's exactly what we want to do now going forward, is, you know, we can be the kind of innovator of new, new ideas, new programmes coming through that can then potentially have a kind of a pan-UK audience. Shetland's a very good series. The audience, uh, both in Scotland and across the UK, have responded to it very, very strongly. Yeah. And the point about Netflix is that, am I right in, in understanding that You've, the BBC have been able to sell that programme internationally, um, but then does that financial income therefore help in your decisions to, uh, to commission more series? Virtually all drama is co-funded from a variety okay. of different sources. Okay. That's actually produced for the BBC by ITV, by ITV. Studios. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you look at Netflix, you'll see quite a few BBC titles. Peaky Blinders, for example, appears on Netflix yeah. with some BBC branding. Um, but the producers typically are getting a range of funding sources to, uh, to, to, to get the tariff to make the programme. Thank you. Okay. Ross Crean. Thanks, Convener. Um, in the previous panel, we've discussed the level, the amount of information uh, disclosed in Ofcom's registers, the, the Out of London uh, register. And David uh, Smith from PAC gave quite a, a helpful example, I thought, where he said that um, it was not particularly granular information that a single 10 minute production would be listed in the same way that a 12 part major production uh, would be. 
from your perspective as broadcasters, if and I know that you are interested in industry confidence and um, improving confidence in relations with independent uh, production companies, what level of information do you think would be helpful uh, to be disclosed as part of the registers? I think David's suggestion of more granular information is useful. I, I do think there's a commercial and confidence thing which you talked about. You know, we can't talk about money, we can't talk about that. But some of the suggestions about durations and number of episodes, I don't think the BBC would have any problem with, them, for instance. No, I mean, I, I think in principle, um, if this if this process. Um, it becomes one that enables a more open discussion about how, how the system is working and as a result of that there is a case for some greater degree of transparency although the, you know, the point about uh, commercial confidentiality is, is well made um, then I think you know, that, that might be a helpful outcome in better understanding exactly what goes on but I think it's also important to, to through this also understand more about how each of our, our processes work and, and that is that you know, there is a very high degree of scrutiny around the categorisation of productions. We have external review of those and we want to be confident in that system. I think there's also an important relationship of trust between producers, broadcasters and Ofcom that you know regulation is part of, but actually the system needs to work because we want it to work and we make it work properly. Um, and we are comfortable and confident from the, from the reviews that we do that that, that is the case. I think it, it's worth... Um, just r reminding people that the, the although the picture for STV as a broadcaster, as distinct from a producer, is uh, is slightly different in as much as 100% of the programmes we make are obviously made in Scotland. Um, nevertheless, because of the regional licence structure that still underpins the Channel 3 network, um, we are using the same criteria as applied to a specific region. So although they're called the Out of London uh, criteria, they also apply to individual regions within the Channel 3 network, which is a regionally diverse uh, series of licences. And to the extent that the... Um, it's important to remember that the output that you see as a register is an output. Um, it is not all of the information that's given to the regulator. So the regulator needs to establish, from a licence point of view, the volume and value calculations to satisfy itself that however exact or inexact or perfect or imperfect the, uh, the calculations and the regulations are, they are, to the regulator's uh, determination, satisfied by what's been actually on screen. And I think the other point was made, Ofcom is an ex-post regulator, so it's only really looking in the rear view mirror as to what's gone out on the TV. However, I would certainly be in favour of any additional information, which particularly if it's in the public domain and as much as it pertains to the number of episodes or series, which is not a commercially confidential item, being included in the register in the interest of transparency. I, I would also just, just add that I think in, in looking at this question, the quotas aren't the be all and end all. So I think it's also important for us to communicate and, and um, you know, bear in mind in, in thinking about it that you know there is a there is a wealth of activity that goes on in terms of sort of off-screen development of, of companies. I think that you know the case of our um, indie growth fund where we've invested in Firecrest, who are based in Glasgow. In the time that we've been um, working with Firecrest as, as investors, they've become the fastest growing indie outside London, and that's a you know fantastic success story. And we're very we're very proud of that, and we want to be doing more of that. It's an important part of the picture in looking at the economic growth. There's also activity that we do outside of the, the quota world, which applies to a sort of narrow set of programmes on the main public service broadcasting channels. But, you know, we are, in, we are investing beyond that. And actually, film is a really interesting example where through Film for Production, obviously, we had T2 um, 18 months or so ago. Um, and this year, we'll have a, a title called Country Music, which um, is made largely in Scotland. And that's, that's economic investment coming into Scotland as a result of that, but it's not captured by, by the quotas. So there's a sort of bigger picture at play to look at as well. And just turning to the, the complaints procedure uh, for a moment, there was, again, I don't want to get too hung up on specific examples that may or may not be representative, but in previous session, there was the example of an outstanding complaint of, of over a year that had been lodged with Ofcom. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the balance of complaints that uh, you receive that go through the Ofcom process compared to complaints that you as broadcasters uh, receive di directly, uh, industry complaints rather than, than audience complaints. Do you receive more complaints directly from industry because there is that existing relationship or are they going through the Ofcom processes? 
I'm, I'm not aware that there are that many complaints. Um, there are clearly a few examples that, that come to light. Um, and in those cases, as far as I'm aware, they have come to us. And when they have come to us, we have looked at those in full, including from um, independent external uh, review body. Um, so in the case of, I think, Man Down is the one that you are referring to, that was reviewed um, and, and was found to be compliant with the regulations as they are drafted on the uh, substantive base and the staff uh, criteria. So it, it met the definition. Um, and Lorraine can talk a bit more about the sort of the substantive base and, and staffing um, elements to that. I think the other example that, that I heard come up this morning was about Eden. Um, now, I think there's a bit of a sort of perception question around how, how the Eden um, experience played out, which is Keogh had a, a, an office in Glasgow. The office was moved from Glasgow during the period in which the programme was being filmed because it was quite a long way from actually where, where the filming was happening and it was more practical to relocate the Scottish office, but it remained a Scottish-based office uh, much closer to, to the, uh, the filming um, location. So I think there was a sort of perception that they sort of vacated where they had been but not recognised as having, having moved. Now, unfortunately, with... I can, sorry, just and I'd, I'd like to come back to the point you, that you're developing... But just on that point about it was relocated, but it was still a Scottish office. Where was it relocated to? To to the location of the filming of and, of the program. And where was that? In it the was Highlands. in the Highlands. In the Highlands. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, unfortunately, with Keogh, the you know the ambition and the intent with with um, with Eden was that it would turn into a long running multi series and actually potentially global format because it was a highly formatted thing so when we went into that the idea and the, and the aspiration was that it could it could represent very significant long-running investment into a scottish based production now unfortunately and as is the way often with television you know this is a this is a high risk hit and miss business and on that occasion the program sadly did not um, work for you know as, as well as we had expected had it done i think we'd be having a very different conversation here today but so i think it's also important to think about the intention going into these projects, whether or not they ultimately succeed, and the intention there was was very, very high ambition. You just can never second guess the yeah. audience, unfortunately. Yeah. And then with Man Down, the producers of that Avalon, we are actually in regular discussions with the exec producer, um, who is looking to develop more ideas over and above Man Down to base, you know, to, to have more of a presence in. Scotland and to have more ideas coming through that office in Scotland. Um, so my team, the Nations and Regions, are working very closely with them. From the BBC side, I'm only aware of the, the, the Ofcom official complaints. We can check up and whether they come from any other source. But I, I think we, as a handful, yeah, we've talked about most of the titles here, if not all of them. Uh, so you know, there are literally hundreds of titles of network production that qualify Scottish. We've talked about most of the handful that there's been queries on today. Yeah. The only other point I would make, we, we tend to forget in all this, there's another side of the story. We have got a lot of Scottish people who work in our network shows that don't count as Scottish. Yeah. I'm aware of European Championships in Glasgow this year. We've got quite a lot of Scottish crew in that. Yeah, we're sending quite a lot of Scottish crew to the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, I know, for instance, the Chelsea Flower Show. Someone that John Smith directs that. There's an awful lot of stuff that's the other side of this. That's stuff that isn't counted. That's significant volumes of Scottish people are working on. So, again, we we have to we have to be careful that, that, that there's another side to this. And so other people could be saying this qualifies as English or Welsh, but there's a lot of Scottish people working on it because that is the case as well. Yeah. I think we, we would acknowledge that and very much welcome folk from Scotland having opportunities, but our priority as a committee is about growing the industry in Scotland. So where someone came from, if they are working in London, they are growing the industry in London. We want to, to grow the industry here in Scotland. So take on board your point, absolutely, um, and it's valuable. But from our perspective, this is about industry growth rather than individuals' destinations. <laughs> To put the other case, the skills individuals have is what attracts the business. So if we've got some people performing big roles and big shows that perform them, they will help attract work back to Scotland. That's so a, that's a slightly longer term Scotland. connection, but that, that happens. Uh, that, that's why we win work, because people trust the creativity and the, the skills of the people we're talking about. Yes. Um, the Ofcom compliance form for um, the regions and nations doesn't require that much detailed information. And I wondered whether on this point you thought that um, those people should be identified as to where they actually live. 
because that's kind of the point that you're making, so that that, that can be proved that they are actually contributing to um, Scottish economic um, growth. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't want to create a world of bureaucracy and huge reports and lists that no one reads. Yeah, so I, actually recording the postcode of everyone who works on a show and where it's from seems to me a bit overzealous. I, I don't know. I, I, but at the moment, they do fill in a form saying they comply. The detail is behind that that we can see and we can review and we do review. And if you know, if there's a query, we we, we follow that up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you've just. Sorry. <laughs> You've heard some anecdotal evidence from the previous panel about um, uh, conversations that are had. Um, well, can you put this through as a Scottish production in your production company? We've visited post-production companies as, uh, as a committee who have told us they've been asked to put a production through their London office so they took qualify. But put, put it on paper as this through their Scottish office, even though it's going through their London office. Um, we have taken other off the record evidence of uh, uh, productions where the, uh, the person in charge on the ground is asking members of the crew if they have a Scottish address, if they can put down their brother in law's address to qualify as Scottish. There's just so much of this information coming forward that suggests that there's quite a lot of them. Um, rule breaking going on and if I could go to the BBC and how the BBC kind of um, establishes the, the accuracy of the forms that are being filled in. Um, we have had a look at the overview of the BBC processes and uh, understand from the guidelines that the, the, the BBC manager will discuss the production with the independent company to satisfy themselves that it's that it will qualify uh, but it's not clear in those guidelines the extent to which the BBC requires its staff to maintain a written record of these discussions like how how the information is uh, recorded and audited uh, clearly you know we've taken extensive um, evidence on this and you know people throughout the sector agree that it's a problem so notwithstanding you've said that um, you know you don't want too much paperwork but clearly if people are filling it, if people are regulating themselves, we need to make sure that they are this is being accurate, the information that they're giving you. And it doesn't seem that there's an audit trail that you can prove that it's accurate. That's me, I think. I, 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 what would it, what would it say? A any of these things that were said earlier, we, if we receive anything official or formal from anyone saying, you know, some of the things that were said by yourself or else, we will follow these up. We, we, we will look at them and they, they don't sound right if that's what's happening we would we would welcome anyone to come and talk to us about these things we do follow up what we're told i don't know we're not here I, I don't think we're hearing about these things directly ourselves so, so that's the first point we do have uh, written records there, there are lists of how it's going to comply etc we do have these things and we do review them yeah the other thing that comes across quite strongly to the committee is that the people that are coming forward with this information, they tend to be their freelancers or their independent production companies, and they feel if they go public on it, it'll jeopardise their livelihood. And that's the reason they're not coming to you. I mean, could you put a system in place where you felt that they could come forward and tell you about these breaches without their livelihood being jeoparded? We'd be very open to anyone providing information. You know, but bear in mind this is an Ofcom quota and, and they are the regulators and the, and the managers of it. You know, those instances of what you know used to be called brass plating or warehousing, I mean again anecdotally, they that, that feels some 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 time ago. Um, obviously on a personal level I'm commissioning for audiences in Scotland. So you know these things aren't aren't, aren't quotas. These are our, our, our kind of lifeblood to make sure it's in Scotland and for audiences in Scotland. But again, going back a ways, there there is a role for uh, production being located in a place that the IP may be somewhere else. It may not be portrayal. Um, going back to Northern Ireland, Game of Thrones has done an amazing job for the sector in Northern Ireland. Um, but there may be some similarities in politics, but it's not actually about there. Um, and the first few series there did have quite a few people, heads of department, coming in. But again, over three or four seasons, that then you know local people got a chance on that. You know that's not that's not brass beating or warehousing. That is a production being encouraged to be somewhere by by a very innovative screen agency. Screen agency. Uh, Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I think certainly it could, one of the key points that uh, this committee uh, is certainly trying to uh, to, to establish <coughs> and uh, and, can, and get over to uh, anyone who comes in to speak to us is it's about Scotland getting 
a fair deal. And Scotland actually getting that uh, that better opportunity to actually um, highlight uh, highlight the benefits of the sector within Scotland, uh, but also increase opportunities uh, for people in Scotland to get involved uh, in the sector. Um, and uh, we've had a, a wide variety uh, of evidence thus far, uh, not just today, but certainly throughout this whole inquiry, uh, where I think that, that there are increasing opportunities, which I think we would all agree to, but clearly uh, there are still some practices that, that are taking place that probably seem to have a have an adverse effect. Uh, and this issue regarding the, the, the data collection and the, the information um, uh, that we just heard about there as well from uh, from Mr. Malcolm, I mean, that that's still <coughs> going to be, uh, still going to be an issue. Uh, I, I accept your point, Mr. Malcolm, uh, regarding the you don't want things to be too bureaucratic. Uh, I think we would all agree to that. But at the same time, uh, if uh, if there is a, a, a process, if there is a, if there is a process that's taking place that all of this uh, kind of bra brass plating or just trying to find an address, then that's not that's not good enough. That's not actually helping people in Scotland get a uh, get get on in this particular sector. No. So if we if we take drama, which we've been talking about, there's fifteen to twenty million pounds of drama. And Steve's talked through the titles that these are great titles. These are great shows that portray Scotland better than we've done before. We think we've got a very strong drama slate that's grown and improved in terms of portrayal. What we do have for each of these dramas, I've tried to say, sorry if I've not explained it correctly, for each of these dramas, 50%, if it's to qualify as Scottish, you'll have to get the 50%, or uh, etc. of the talent. There will be a list of all the crew in that show with a guarantee from the production company that they are based in Scotland. Yes, sir? Uh -huh. We have that, we do get that, we don't make it public, yes? We review it uh, if asked to, and we review it up front before the Commission as well, yeah? If these are not been filled in correctly or dishonestly, uh, then, you know, that's another issue entirely that we would take very seriously if we found that out, yeah? So I, I don't think it's... We're, we're happy at the level of granularity that we see. Uh, we review it. Uh, I, I, I don't know what beyond that we're, we're sort of saying. If there's dishonesty on behalf of production companies, that's a different matter. Huh? You mentioned earlier regarding the not wanting to go and ask uh, if, if anyone who's involved in the programme. You, you really don't want to kind of go and ask about their, where they stay, what their address is, their postcode. Um, but surely if you're employing um, a particular production company to undertake a piece of work uh, on behalf of the BBC, then I mean, they will have their details because I mean, well, they pay tax somewhere. So they will have their details. So that really shouldn't be an onerous piece of work just to establish exactly where people actually live. Production companies do that, yeah. I mean, if you're saying by a matter of course, should we go through and check that line by line, if that's what you're suggesting, that's that, that would be a level of work that we don't currently do. Huh? Hmm. By checking it against tax records or something, hmm. we don't do that, no. Hmm. no. Uh, to, to address as well because being a publisher broadcaster we rely on producers for content and suppliers so we've got to take the word of the production company that they have done their own audit if you like of where the crew are from um, and then they are self-regulating you know with the Ofcom so I think that's quite a difficult thing from a broadcaster's point of view to actually do. But in terms of what we do, Channel 4, as the publisher broadcaster, we do, in my department as Nations and Regions, our team look to nurture talent in kind of creative hubs, if you like, um, and Glasgow being one of them. At the moment, in Glasgow, we're working with um, over 27 independent production companies and in, dis in regular dialogue with 50 suppliers to the channel. And we are trying to get to know each of the teams within that as well so that we know who they've got and possibly staff with at different levels that are ready to make that next move. Because what is quite difficult in Glasgow and in other nations and regions is actually retention of staff and retention of talent. So as if there's opportunities there, you know, so that they can keep moving within the career ladder, then that's always a, a good thing. So I think a mixed ecology of programmes from all the different broadcasters so that we can retain the talent is important. 
Just one final question. Right. Do you think that the, the regulatory framework uh, that's uh, currently in place is actually sufficient um, in terms of the uh, in terms of how Scotland is actually portrayed uh, in the media? Portrayal is a very difficult thing <coughs> to regulate. I, I think um, there we've talked a lot about the composition of production. Uh, the people who make the production, the spend, the activity. I think, you know, if, if I'm if I'm right off the top of my head, and we, as I say, we are a, we're a 100% Scotland-focused broadcaster, but I'm not aware of any portrayal obligation in our licence or indeed any of the other licences. And I think this is one where there has to be a degree of editorial freedom um, uh, but a very clear expectation that there will be, in the best you know, traditions of public service broadcasting, uh, portrayal, representation, cultural diversity, and so on and so forth. Um, I, think, I don't think there is. Um, I don't think there is portrayal regulation or legislation as such, um, and I think that is a very difficult instrument to draft and, and implement, and I think... Um, but that, I think that's the answer to your question. I don't think there is portrayal regulation per se. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would echo that. I mean, I think, you know, try, trying to find metrics that work in a, in a creative context like that is incredibly hard. However, I mean, I think, I think in the last few years there has been, across the industry and certainly within Channel 4, um, an even greater degree of emphasis placed on ensuring that we are being diverse across everything we do, both on and off screen. On screen, you know, as we, as we said, it's hard to measure, but you know, representation and portrayal of different communities, cultures, backgrounds in all the various different shapes and sizes is mm. is a really important thing for us. We have tried. We have a, a diversity um, report that we publish every year. Um, we set ourselves a very extensive range of, sort of 30 metrics within that, boiling them down when you're talking about creative decision makers to very, very tiny sort of micro subsets of subsets is is very difficult but it's certainly something that has become much more front of mind in in both the way we run the business and in the way that creative decisions are made um, and i think through our for all the uk plan that we've published diversity and ensuring that the diversity of the uk is better represented as a result of that is something we are going to hold ourselves to account for um, and we will do our best to to ensure that we are telling those stories when we come to account for that even if it's not in kind of cold numbers terms and Rachel Hamilton, did you have a supplementary? It's not supplementary, but it was based on the last panel uh, questioning that I had. It's just a one question. If we could, if I'll make it very quick. Uh, the last panel said that building trust and relationships was very important, and that was going to be the key to success um, for the screen sector. I just wondered how you go about that and how your Scottish-based commissioners do build that trust and those relationships in order to increase uh, drama production, for example. I mean, we don't know where the three creative hubs are going to be for Channel 4. But um, my team, the Nations and Regions team, we are embedded in the commissioning teams in London. And we also are based in Glasgow, which is you know great for the Scottish Indies, not so good for the, the Welsh ones. Um, but in doing that, we uh, being embedded in the commissioning teams means that we can share the intel that we gather from them. And the good thing about our job is that we are cross-genre. So we can mix between features and current affairs, fact end, um, and docs, and we can gather insight as to what the commissioners are wanting at any given time and then feed that back to different production companies. Um, we have regular routines with production companies, um, as I said, 27, that we will sit and go through the development slate with those companies and we will help shape ideas according to the brief that we've managed to gather from the commissioners. Um, and that's actually worked. It's starting to bear fruit um, now and we've got a lot of different ideas in paid development and a few commissions um, off the back of that. Um, we also run a programme of briefings um, which take us all throughout the, the UK. We ran 21 last year and six were in Scotland where we take commissioners, it's like a roadshow, if you like, um, where we take commissioners and they give their latest brief to um, producers. But we've started to really tailor them so that they're very specific to the needs or, the, um, or where certain 
producers are maybe they're they're not breaking into certain genres um, and some of the higher tariff genres. So we'll, we'll really tailor the briefs for that. Um, and also the nations and regions team, we have the Alpha Fund, which is a small pot of money, but can offer financial support to um, companies. We Alpha funded three companies last year, um, totalling £80,000. And we see... Um, actually five times the return on each pound of that, which is quite significant. And so although it's seed money, it does actually, you know, um, deliver, if you like. And we're currently in discussions with um, Creative Scotland and other partners to see how we can make that money go further. Because coming from a creative background myself and development, um, it is a rejection business. So the more relationships and partnerships that we can um, have to bolster development and bolster development teams, then I think you'll actually see you know, more commissions in, in the areas. On to some questions about the Screen Agency and Creative Scotland uh, from Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, Steve Carson described the Northern Ireland uh, Screen as a very innovative screen agency. So I'd be interested in what the panel's views are about the Scottish Screen Unit that is due to launch on the 1st of April. Um, have there been discussions with yourselves around what partnerships can be created? And I understand there's memorandum of understandings to be coming forward and... Do you know what any progress that's been made in, in those areas? Welcome, as I said earlier, any partnerships that will help with development um, because we see what impact our Alpha Fund can have on companies. Sophie mentioned earlier, Firecrest being one of them and David Strachan in, in the previous session um, with TERN, Alpha Funding helped turn and um, make routes into the channel and then have five commissions last year, which was quite incredible. Um, so I think any partnerships that we can have and conversations that we can have um, is all a positive step. And we are in dialogue at the moment with the screen agency and seeing how we can move forward and work a strategy between us. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're obviously talking to Creative Scotland and, and working towards a, a, a memo of understanding, I think. Uh, we're very keen to get engaged with the screen unit when it starts. And, you know, again, I think you can see when you when you have a, an agency focused on, on broadcast, obviously from an economic activity point of view, uh, I like to, you know, the investments the BBC's been putting into Scotland is £40 million, including, uh, you know, nearly 20 for, for potentially new channels subject to the to the regulator. You know the, that kind of multiplier effect between the money the screen unit can put into the sector, um, and what all you know host of broadcasters are doing. You know, you know the momentum I think is very strong coming into the sector comparatively recently. I have found there's a very strong range of suppliers here who do actually have experience now of working you know locally and network across all the genre. So I, I think that money properly deployed is coming at exactly the right time. Mm -hmm. I think I would echo that uh, we. I think partly because of the roots of Scottish Screen and the Scottish Arts Council, I think there was uh, at that time a bit of a gap in television production specifically. And when the agencies joined to become Creative Scotland, I I'm not sure that that was addressed. I think it is being known. And um, like others, we are engaged in talking uh, formally with the, the Screen Industry Leadership Group, which we are part, and uh, on a bilateral basis with the Screen Unit. And we welcome the additional investment into the sector. And uh, as I say, we, we are positively engaged. Okay, thank you. And I wonder if the BBC can maybe say a little bit more about the proposal for the new channel, which I know is sitting with Ofcom at the moment, but there's been some discussion on the panel and from MSP this morning about portrayal. Um, is, the, what is the purpose of the channel to respond to some of those issues or could you maybe say a bit more about what its intention is? In part, we're, we're content on the channel. We're working closely with colleagues in network where, you know, something could be co-funded by channel or developed by channel, which could then go to network. I think it'll, it'll help that portrayal pipeline. Uh, you know, the channel put simply as a way of, you know, improving our offer to, to audiences uh, in Scotland in conjunction with our other services. Bear in mind, you know, we've also responsibility for radio, digital, BBC One Scotland, you know, would, would remain a key service for us. Uh, the investment will create 900 hours of uh, original content. Uh, that is going to make a, a, a big impact, and it's going to provide Scottish audiences with a whole range of, of, of different genre. Uh, you know, you know about the hour-long news service and what that can bring. 
um, you know, we're we're commissioning already into um, uh, some serious factual pieces. We're again close. I, I hope to doing some co-funded drama, uh, comedy, and factual pieces as well. Um, the money that's invested directly into the channel, we're obviously working with suppliers. Um, uh, we're bringing other money in. We've we've greenlit a, a factual series there recently that's got several hundred thousand pounds in from a from a distributor, for example. Working with colleagues in uh, nations, potentially co-productions with with other broadcasters as well. Um, so that, that that should have an economic impact. I think ultimately it's for audiences in Scotland to find, you know, uh, a huge amount of content that they uh, they like and they feel relevant feel relevant to them. Yeah. Lorraine mentioned development funding and the, the term it's a rejection business. And uh, when we were in when we were in Northern Ireland um, uh, talking about uh, both to the screen agency uh, uh, and also to the independent production sector, they said that one of the really helpful things that the agency was able to do was development money and an understanding that the development money wouldn't always result in a production being made because, as you say, it was a rejection business. Um, are you? Is that? Would you like to see the new screen unit be able to do that? And um, what do you think its role should be in assisting with television development? I think what what we've seen huge benefit from is actually looking at slate development. So, saying to a company, you know, it's not just one idea. We won't help fund you for one project and development because that's not really sustainable. And what we want to do is help encourage growth within the sector, growth within each independent company, so that it becomes sustainable and so that they be they get into all year round production because then that's when things can start moving. That's what happened with IWC um, and location, location, location several years ago. And that was transformative for the sector in, in Scotland. And, you know, a lot of indies actually kind of grew from that as well. So there was that kind of halo effect, if you like. Um, so we think that slate development is the, the way that you will reap the most rewards because funding a project when it's already in production, well, we would hope that the broadcaster would be able to finance you know if not fully um, that they would finance a good chunk of it and then there's other options for producers in terms of going for distribution or co-production to get the top-up funding that they require so I think in terms of growth and sustainability um, slate development funding is a really good way of, of moving it forward. I mean I would, I would just add to that that I, you know as Lorraine says we think that the development funding is, is absolutely vital to that, to achieving those long-term goals of genuine, deep-rooted growth. I think there's also a, a bigger point here, which is, you know, all of us here are focused on delivering UK economic growth for the UK, for UK audiences, whether that's through the investment or the portrayal. What underpins that is a very, very strong, vibrant public service broadcasting sector that has multiple players with different business models and different objectives. But actually, we all share a common objective, which is to ensure that the, our, our UK strengths are as, as strong as they can be. You know, we've also heard this morning about uh, you know the role and the influence of the, the fan companies. Now, they represent huge opportunity in many ways, and for producers, you know, I think there were some really exciting things going on. But interestingly, they are not doing the same things as we're doing. They're not investing in the same types of things. They're not thinking about Indigenous audiences in, in the same way as we are, and nor, I suspect, are they as focused on that sort of grassroots investment to help deliver that long-term growth. So I think there's an important part of this, which is to think about the regulatory structures, both in terms of quite specific objectives, but also the big regulatory structures that sit behind us and ensure that ultimately we're able to generate as much revenue as we can and reinvest as much back as we can into UK-produced content for UK audiences. How, how will the impact of the screen unit be measured? Well, how would you measure success in the screen unit? The, the, the biggest measure is the doubling of turnover. That, that, that's the first measure they've set out as one of their objectives. Yeah. One, one of the uh, issues that's been raised um, as a challenge is the data uh, collection in the industry. And the Northern Ireland Agency sits within their economic development uh, strand uh, and the Head of the agency told us they had very, very good data uh, on, on the, the sector, um, which is something that uh, has been identified as a gap here by the Screen Sector Leadership Group. How do you think, do you think, do you agree that that's a problem and how do you think it should be addressed? 
terms of, of, of data, you're right that Northern Ireland Screen is sort of primarily an economic investment agency, so they, did a, they do a huge amount of, you know, econometrics work on, on multiplier effects and things like that. Uh, you know, the, the data on, on, on spend and quotas is sort of rather readily available. So, you know, I take the point about, you know, potentially going into deeper data on the Ofcom requirements, but in terms of overall spend and the effects that could be happening through an economy, I think that is that's readily available, I think. I think it's easy to get the broadcast. I mean, we, we, will all, we will all participate in supplying, you know, what we spend, how we spend it, etc. I think the industry more broadly with film, etc., and freelance and money coming from it is, is the difficult bit uh, that Screen Unit finds how to get a handle on. Uh, and that will be difficult to capture, I think. Yeah. I, I think right, but I think, I think the, the emphasis with these sorts of exercises in, in developing metrics should always be on the outputs rather than... The, the things going in so you know the, the more that the, the metrics that are are defined and used are about economic investment multiplier effects um, employment and and those sorts of things but uh, you know as, as has been said we we are very well used to sharing that sort of data and I'm sure whatever framework is put around that we will we will want to help contribute to that I think you need to see the delta effect on the existing data. I think that I think that one of the difficulties is if you spend too much time developing new metrics and KPIs, it's difficult to know what the difference is. Whereas there are well established, uh, say imperfect though they may be, trends in production spend, economic activity that's already established. And I think it's much easier to take a view on what difference has this intervention made over two, three years, whatever rather than to start measuring something new which you have no history of. OK, well, thank you very much for coming to give evidence today. Uh, and we shall now uh, suspend and go into private session. Thank you very much. <laughs>